All right, welcome back to another episode of Debunking Missionary Claims, the New Testament. Don't bet your soul on it. Part 3, the Bible in the 1st and early 2nd century with Rabbi Moshe Shulman. Sit tight. We will be right back. <laughs> yeah. Welcome to Tanakh Talk. I'm your host, William Hall, broadcasting live out of Kingsland, Texas, USA, with another episode of Debunking Missionary Claims with Rabbi Moshe Shulman. As always, an interesting and very, maybe not confrontational, but controversial for sure. Rabbi, welcome back. It's good to have you here. And as okay. usual, welcome back. Yeah. I will be here this week, and uh, I'm hearing an echo. Do you have an... Oh, you know what? Hold on a second here. It just showed up here for some reason. Let me double check something here. Uh, some people like to themselves. But yeah. Like Are you still hearing it? Um, let me say. Yeah, still there. Okay. How about now? Is that better? Um, let's see. No, it's still there. Okay. Let me do something. I'm going to let you go ahead and... Get second. I think it just went away. Oh, did it? Okay, cool. Cool, cool, cool. Okay, good. Okay. Okay. Very good. Okay. So, anyways... Um, yeah, last week was Passover, so I wasn't here, so we couldn't do it. Right. So, uh, by the way, in two weeks I'm going to be in Israel. I don't think the time's going to work out, so like, okay. I guess for two weeks I'll have to, you have to miss me, but um, visiting family in Israel, I have two kids that live there. Okay, this week is uh, show number 11 in Debunking the Missionaries. This is the third one in our new series of shows on the New Testament, Don't Bet Your Soul on It. And in this one, we're going to start probably the next two, maybe three, dealing with uh, the, the development to the uh, New Testament in the first and second centuries. So we're talking about from the time that uh, Jesus was to die, died until then. Now, um, when Jesus died, we're going, to, we're going to have a whole series of, of shows dealing with the historical Jesus and historicity and some, a lot of issues around that. So I'm going to uh, have to leave that to the side, but I first wanted to deal with the New Testament itself um, as to why uh, you shouldn't bet your soul on it. Okay. Very good. So basically that's what we're, what we're going to do is we're going to deal with um, going from the events of a life of a person and his death and until we start getting what we might call the uh, New Testament itself, which is going to actually start occurring in the second century. Okay. Okay. Very good. Yeah. The first thing that we have to recognize is that, as I mentioned the last time, um, I mentioned a few issues the last time, the last two ones. We talked again about the difference between Tanakh and the New Testament. Then we talked about the New Testament. Um, we talked about which, what are different parts of it. Paul has letters, which are basically to tell a theology. There's the Gospels, basically telling about Jesus' life. Acts, which is going to become very important in uh, either later on in today's or the next week ones, um, telling the history of the early church, uh, Revelation, which is a um, uh, a prophetic book, pretty much uh, of that style. Um, and basically, I mentioned that there are certain things that we want to look at when we examine it, um, and, and we'll we'll come with those again and again. Um, one of the points that we're going to, is going to be very important for us now is to understand um, how how we got these books of the Gospels, you know, specifically is what we're going to deal with, you know, and of course the other parts of the New Testament. We're dealing with events that occurred in the earlier part of the first century. Um, uh, when we talk about historical Jesus, we'll talk about, you know, and the uh, resurrection. We'll talk about the different possible dates when Jesus could have died. Um, usually it's between either 30 or 33 uh, CE in the Common Era, but sometimes it has different times. So we're talking about what happened from then until we actually start seeing the first formation of books um, as a canon put together, which really doesn't start occurring to the second uh, century and again, we're going to go through the how we go from one place to another looking at the sources So the first thing I want to bring out is um, <clears throat> Some of the issues involved now I mentioned that I have a book here called the formation of the Christian biblical canon 
from a Lee McDonald. Lee McDonald is a professor, adjunct professor at uh, Fuller Theological Seminary, and he's a senior minister at First Baptist Church, a um, uh, First Baptist Church in uh, California. So he makes a point here, which is something that I believe a lot of people um, are not aware of. There seems to be an understanding of people that, yeah, well, you know, after Jesus died, everybody wrote down what they could remember. And these things were just like handed around and handed around and whatever. And, and then uh, eventually, um, you know, it got put into books. And this is not actually the case that occurred, um, except the exact opposite is the case. There was for quite a while a reliance and a preference for um, oral teachings, things that were handed down from people who heard from people who heard from people. Um, so this McDonald has an interesting quote here, which I'd like to read because it's a point that uh, is very important to understand when we do want to discuss about those original manuscripts. We talk about Matthew, the original manuscript of Matthew. Um, in the uh, debates and discussions about the concept of inerrancy, you will see uh, the more scholarly Christians will say, well, when we say inerrancy, we say the original Matthew manuscript was inerrant. It could be that later on, copy of scribes, scribes did different things, whatever, and a lot of these we're going to run into when we talk about the canon, um, that this, this isn't, doesn't really affect it because it's the original which is inerrant. So we want to discuss and get into whether we really can say such a thing as that, that the originals were inerrant. That's going to be what the point is I'm going to try and deal with now. But he says something very important here, and I think we want to listen to what he says. From the beginning, the proclamation about the death and resurrection of Jesus, as well as the teaching of Jesus, circulated among the Christian churches in oral form. Sounds very much like the Hasidim, by the way, which is a, I'll give a comparison to that very soon. Some of this tradition was written down quite early, from 35 to 65 CE. He's saying like, you know, three, three years or so. But much of it remained in oral form for a considerable period of time. Now it continues, and this is where it becomes very important. Uh, Papias, who lived some 120, 140 in the Common Era, Papias would become very, very important uh, in one of our later discussions of the canon, because he's a witness to the Book of Matthew. Papias, as late as 120, 140, could still say that he preferred these oral communications to the written message of books, namely the Gospel of Matthew and Mark. So even into the early second century, there were still people who preferred uh, the teachings and the stories that they heard from people who heard from people rather than um, you know, any kind of written communication. Now we're talking about 100 years later. Just think of it in your mind, 100 years ago was um, the First World War. So it's basically saying that he preferred hearing recollections of people who heard from their grandfathers in, in the, what happened in the First World War, as opposed to reading an actual history book of the First World War. That's, that's putting a comparison with saying. Papias' well-known preference is quoted in Eusebius. Eusebius wrote in the fourth century. He was well-known to Constantine. For I did not suppose that information from books would help me so much as the word of a living and surviving voice. According to F.C. Bauer, Papias appears to have wanted to keep the immediacy of the original revelation as a present reality by clinging to the living word, not to the dead, transient, written text. Okay, now there's a lot of things that we, could, we, can, we can unpack from that, but I think the main issue we want to understand is that even into the second century, um, oral teachings were what was considered um, better more important by quite a number of people. Even when they were beginning to have the written texts uh, starting to become available, still the oral teaching was what's considered more important. Again, to Papias and others, there were others that were obviously were dealing with written texts, but others dealt with orally. Now, this presents a couple of problems. So I'd like to go back to our book from uh, Mike Lucona. Uh, that's his book on uh, the resurrection of Jesus, new historiographical approach on page 35. We read from this last week. Actually, not last week, two weeks in the last show. So he says something very important with regards to oral teachings. And 
I think it's important that uh, we listen to what he says and unpack it. This is, again, Bacona is a very well-known apologetics, apologist and debater on issues of the resurrection and the history. Another fact that contributes to the difficulty of knowing the past is the occasional unreliability of eyewitness testimony. Okay, just because you see it doesn't mean that you actually saw it the way it actually occurred. Lucian writes of those who lie about being eyewitnesses when in fact they were not. Um, so some people say that they saw something they didn't even see at all, but even if they did see it, it's sometimes not exactly as it came about. But even reports by eyewitnesses attempting to be truthful have challenges. Now, here I want you to unpack something and keep this in mind because it's going to come up soon. Even eyewitnesses who are trying to be truthful about seeing something will, in fact, have challenges and make mistakes. Uh, Zabel notes that the eyewitness must first accurately perceive it, has to be able to see it correctly. Two, remember with precision events that happen very quickly. Of course, it's easy to forget where something um, that took longer is you know, much easier to remember. Um, we talked about last time, for example, histo histories and the gospel themselves are considered like Greek type, Greek Roman type histories where they would give speeches and the speeches wouldn't be exactly what would be said, but would be similar to it. That's what he's saying here, that they remember it, it, it with precision. Number three, truthfully stated. And this is the one we're going to concentrate on a lot today. Truthfully stated, meaning state things as they were, not with your interpretation or reinterpretation. And four, successfully communicate it to others, meaning that you're able to give over what you heard in a problem. Moreover, even bona fide witnesses who were both sober and sincere often provide conflicting testimonies. Many times we see people seeing the same event who seem to have seen things differently, um, having missed things. So he gives an example here. Did the Titanic break in half, as many eyewitnesses claimed, or did it go down intact, as reported by other eyewitnesses? Um, so the multiple eyewitnesses actually talks about later that, in fact, the Titanic actually, they, they actually saw the Titanic and it split. So what about the people who thought it went down straight? Well, they, they just missed it. The information they had was not correct. Now, we have, I think, really good examples in modern times um, that deal with the same type of issue here. Um, something that, of course, to me is uh, very apparent, and that's uh, Hasidim. Hasidim are very well known to, um, and the rabbis are very well known to, tell stories of either previous rabbis or, um, for example, specifically we're talking about the Baal Shem Tov now, who was the founder of the Hasidic movement. Um, and the question is, of course, how believable are they? There was a very famous rabbi who was a great grandson of the, 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 the Rebbe de Be'er, the Magad from Mezit, Shulfanishin, who said that um, if you believe all the stories from Baal Shem Tov, you're a fool, but if you don't believe that Baal Shem Tov could have done it, then you are an apocorus, a heretic. Meaning that we recognize that stories sometimes come down which aren't exactly the way they are. Now, one of the most important works, and this is going to dovetail with what we talk now, one of the most important works um, on this um, from the Baal Shem Tov is a work called Shifchi HaBaal Shem Tov. The praise of the Bashem, but here's what it looks like. This is my Hebrew copy. They actually came out with an English a number of years ago. It's called In Praise of the Bashem. So if you like any kind of Hasidic books with uh, stories, I would suggest getting that one. The reason is most of the stories here are actually brought down in the name of the person who is actually personally involved. So, for example, um, one of the stories he starts here, he says, um, I heard from my father-in-law. His father-in-law happened to have been a scribe in the house of the Baal So he hears from him and he tells the story of what he happened happen to him there. And he brings the names of people and those who are familiar with people who were from the original Hasidim around the Baal Shem Tov, you hear the names of all these type of people. However, in this particular book also, he added, uh, an, uh, an, before he got to the actual text of those things, mostly the story he, he heard from his father-in-law or from other people, but before he gets it, he, he gives a very long account that he heard from somebody who wasn't a primary source, was a secondary source. And a lot of Hasidim don't believe these stories that he told in that part, whereas the other ones that he had direct sources to, he believed. The point that I'm trying to get here is when you have oral traditions, even in oral cultures or where oral tellings of stories 
are considered important. It's not necessarily the case that something gets written down in a book is actually reflective of what actually happened. Okay? Um, it just happens. Now, this is not necessarily nefarious. Sometimes people forget. You'll find a lot of times if you look at uh, Hasidic books of stories, you'll sometimes see stories and you look in a different book, you send a native from a different rabbi, for example. Well, it's possible that the both rabbis did the same type of thing, but it's also possible that some just made a mistake seeing it over. Also, I can tell you as a fact, my rabbi was a um, would tell stories very, very often. One of the big things he was known for is actually telling stories. Um, anybody know, who would have Shlomo Karbach knows, um, Shlomo Karbach said that he actually learned how to tell stories from my rabbi. Um, he would tell stories. But interesting enough, he would never tell the same story twice exactly the same. It would be something a little bit different, depending on the point he's trying to make. Again, the point I'm trying to make here is when we're talking about oral tradition, many people make the assumption that an oral tradition, even in a, con uh, in a culture which involves oral teaching, that it means it's going to be exact. And that's actually not the case of what it is. Um, things are told over basically to get the point, but sometimes the wording is different. And here we're talking about the case where people are trying to be actually truthful, but we are going to now move to an examination where the case can be that actually the stories that are being told for the negative New Testament are actually not really true. Now, one of the um, challenges posed to those who criticize things like the um, uh, resurrection and other things about the historical nature of, of, of Jesus is that you need to come up with an, a theory, an alternate theory to um, just the supposition that the stories that are coming down are basically people telling the stories and while they may have some little errors and things but basically the stories are correct what is your alternate theory to it? So right now I'm going to bring you an alternate theory. It doesn't affect so much now but it will of course affect this certain period of time, and when we talk about the historical Jesus, the resurrection, and things like that, we will we will see how this alternate theory actually um, helps very much and explains very much what's going on. So, what's this alternate theory? There have been studies done starting in um, the 1950s by a groundbreaking work by three psychologists, uh, Leon Festinger. Henry W. Reichern, and Stanley Schechter. Now, what did they do? This is something very interesting. They wanted to, you know, as a psychologist, they like to analyze people the way they act, how they, what they're going to do to things. So in the time when they did this, this was in the 1950s, I don't remember what year it is. I think it was 57, maybe a little bit earlier. Um, there happened to have been a group who at that time were claiming that um, space aliens were going to come down and the world was going to end on a certain date. Now, these psychologists heard about this and they said, you know what, this would be an interesting study. Let's study the group. We can go there and, you know, just tell them we just want to, you know, what's going on, study it. And let's find out what happens when these space aliens don't come down, if they don't come down, obviously, you know, because they didn't believe they'd come down, of course, they didn't come down. And end the world. So let's do it. So that's exactly what it is. The book talks about um, interviewing the people, what they what they thought, everything about them, and up until the actual day and time when the space aliens were predicted by the prophecy. But the leader had a prophecy that the aliens were supposed to come at a certain time. She said she was in communication with them, and they were communicating with her telepathically. And then the time came, and they didn't come. And what happened afterwards? So what they found is what happened afterwards is, in fact, um, rather than them falling apart, they actually continued. And they became um, actually very evangelical about their beliefs. There were some mo modifications about it, but basically they continued on. And let me just read his conclusions when he came here. And I want you to think about this. And in thinking about this, um, I'm going to have to, of course, prove it to you, but think about it. Does this sound a little bit what might have happened when Jesus, who was supposed to be Messiah, dies? As opposed to having fulfilled his messianic goal of setting up a kingdom at the time of his life. 
as the Jewish people, of course, believed would have happened. So let me say, see, read what he says here. In the preceding page, excuse me, I just swallowed my tongue. In the preceding pages of this book, and especially in the last chapter, we have fully documented one instance of a curious phenomenon. The increase of proselyting, prosel, proselyting, proselyting, following unequivocal disconfirmation of a belief. So what he's saying here simply is, instead of them falling apart when these space aliens didn't come down, they in fact went more into evangelizing their beliefs. But in chapter one, it was made clear that our intention was not simply to show that such a phenomenon can occur, but rather to go further and specify the conditions that will determine whether or not it will occur. So what he's saying here, okay, what has to happen in order that it should move from one stage to another? They were basically hoping that it would, ha would happen, would happen. So they wanted to know what are the conditions psychologically going on there that would actually lead to it. So let's listen to it. Number one. There must be a conviction. Space aliens coming down. Um, Jesus being the Messiah. There must be commitment to this conviction. Okay, people separating themselves. Um, people becoming disciples and running, going around with Jesus, as the New Testament says. The conviction must be amenable to unequivocal disconfirmation. Either space aliens came or not. Um, as all sources indicate to us, and you see this certainly is that way, there were messianic people who believed in Messiah in the first century, many of them. And their goal was to set up a kingdom, a renewed Jewish kingdom under a Davidic king. Um, Bar Kokhba's re re revolt in, in the 130s against Hadrian was the same way. So either that happened or it didn't happen. In the case, Jesus dies and it doesn't happen. Such unequivocal discombination must occur, and it must occur, of course, obviously. Um, the space aliens, of course, have not come down here unless somebody in our audience has been hiding this truth from us. Um, as far as we know, the world has not ended, and space aliens have not come down to save us or whatever they're supposed to do. Okay, and as it was, Jesus did not set up a uh, renewed Davidic kingdom um, in the first century. Social support must be available subsequent to this confirmation. There must be a group supporting one another. And if we look in the book of Acts, we see, in fact, there was a group. The apostles did stay together, and they did support of each other. So, um, again, this doesn't, hasn't proven anything. I'm going to give you some proofs later on for that. So this is what he says when prophecy fails. Now, the interesting thing is, is after that study, this spurred a lot of people to say, well, one second. Maybe this was just a one-shot deal. Maybe it didn't, ha didn't happen. Maybe it's just, you know, okay, this was a physical case. Maybe it doesn't happen again. So this spurred a lot of PhD theses and a whole, whole bunch of articles and stuff like that. And what came out later on, um, this work that I have here came out in the year 2000, a very pro propitious time. A lot of people thought 2000 and the Messiah was going to come. It's called Expecting Armageddon. Oh, I didn't show the other book. Let me show you the other book. The other book's called One Prophecy Fails, those people who like to read these things. Um, it's an interesting read, but of course, if you're reading all the material, you probably won't have a life after that, so maybe you want to rely on me. It's called Expecting Armageddon. In it, he brings a number of articles written about um, groups that did, in fact, continue afterwards, and some groups that actually failed afterwards, in order to have some kind of a psychological analysis as to what happened. Now, one of the work groups that he uh, follows here, that you find in here, um, discussed, is uh, the witnesses, Jehovah's Witnesses. Because they have a very interesting history. Um, in the, the late 1800s, they had a prediction of Jesus coming back in 1878. Uh, he didn't come, so they changed it to 1881. That didn't happen, they changed it to 1914, then they changed it to 1928, and then 1925, and now I guess it's just He's coming back, but we don't know when he's coming. Uh, so they have actually an article in this by um, a fellow named Joseph F. Zygmunt. He talks about it, and he gives us some information here, which is very, very um, interesting and revealing. So he says that after these ha things happen and they keep coming up, 
he tries to uh, classify what actually we did see happen. So what he says is like this. the first reaction that they have is that of disappointment. They seem to be puzzled, they're confused what's going to actually happen. This happened both to the leaders and the rank and file. The second was is they adjusted to it. And they usually re re regress to a time earlier meaning there was a little bit of a slowing down in the proselytizing. However, the third thing is, sooner or later, they resolve the quandary, either coming up with a new time or, you know, an explanation as to why it doesn't work this time, why it's going to be later. Um, Jesus coming back soon, this generation, until um, just wait and you're going to be taken up into heaven sometime. Um, and of course, we see even nowadays a lot of people prophesying Jesus on this time. I believe he, he's already overcome. The world was supposed to end a few years ago, and it didn't happen. Number four is a change in stati strategy in order to uh, revitalize the group. And besides that, they basically, and then the fifth thing is that they actually um, start to redefine things and to, you know, start teaching things in a slightly different way. Now, also another one in, brought in here which is of interest, before he gets to other cases, the witnesses aren't so much interested as far as I'm concerned, because after all, the witnesses aren't Jewish. And I want to bring some Jewish examples here, where we see a similar type of thing happening. So he, he in, in a later article by, by Gordon Melton, um, he also discusses um, these failures that happened in the, in the past and what happens. And he makes a few interesting notes. The believer, however, does not react to the non-occurrence of the event by admitting failure. Very important. That Jesus was died was not considered a failure. Um, and we're going to have a couple instances here we're going to actually see was not considered a failure. To do so, we're calling to question the total experience of the group. Instead, the believer begins a process of reinterpretation. What did it mean? The believer begins to see that the prophecy was incorrect. Not that the prophecy was incorrect, but the group merely misunderstood it in a material, earthly manner. So, um, Jesus is going to be coming soon, after returning soon, eventually becomes Jesus is coming back, but we don't know when. The truth came at a spiritual level, invisible except to the eye of faith. Thus, from the original prophecy event, the believer create an invisible spiritual and more importantly, unfalsifiable event. What he's trying to say here, which is very interesting, Whereas beforehand, there was an, a clear event. Either it happened or it didn't happen. But here what happens is when the event clearly does not occur, under the conditions that we see here, they reinterpret it in a way that there's no way that it cannot happen. So 2,000 years after Jesus died, there's no problem he didn't come back originally. Why? Well, because it's been reinterpreted. Re that is well known in the first century. There was a very strong belief, eschatological belief, that Jesus was coming soon. Um, Paul indicates this in a lot of his letters. Uh, there's indications in the Gospels that they really expected Jesus to have come back soon. Whereas later on in the later letters and stuff like that, we find that it comes later. And of course, by the second century, Jesus coming back soon is Jesus coming back sometime. It becomes re 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 reinterpreted. Again, I'm not saying that I've proven my point yet. I'm just throwing out these ideas so that they're in the back of your mind because I'm going to give you one example that you probably never even thought about but actually proves that this is exactly what happened. And we shall get up to that soon. But first, there's more things to teach. So on page 155 in this book, he brings a little more information. Again, as he says, whereas Zygmunt um, said that they actually agreed that the prophecy failed. He's saying that as an alternative, I propose beginning with Zygmunt's suggestion that prophecies which to the outside appear to have failed may not have failed for the millennial group as a whole. Though individual members may go through varying levels of doubt after the predicted event fails to happen. The now within the group of what to outside observers is obvious failure of a prophecy, prophecy is accomplished through the two process of spiritualization of the prophecy and reaffirmation of the group's faith and life by reference to the larger context of group belief and experience. 
Let's look at the other stuff here. Um, scholarly gobbledygook, if you want to say. So what does it really mean on a practical level? Okay, before I do something practical, let me just reiterate what I'm trying to say. What I'm trying to say is, it's a well-known, you might call it a syndrome, a well-known thing that happens. Groups make a prophecy on such and such a day, something is going to happen. That event does not happen. Given the conditions that um, we mentioned before, that it, 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 uh, it's a certain time, it's clear that it could be happening, but that there's a group around there and they can redefine what it is, they will actually go on further afterwards and actually become stronger in what they're doing and continue. Okay? Now, the obvious um, comparison to, to the Jesus movement of the first century is, is very important. Now, this would affect, of course, the canon, because remember, the canon and the stories are all coming about post-Jesus' death, meaning when the reinterpretation has already occurred. So before I get to show you actually how we know from the New Testament itself that that is actually the case, um, let's do a couple of instances in Judaism where we actually see it, where um, uh, messianic expectation happened. Um, it did not occur for various reasons. And afterwards, um, a core group of people still continued in that belief. Okay. The first example that many may know um, is Shabsi Tzvi. Shabsi Tzvi lived in, I believe, the 17th century, 16th century. Um, the story was like this. Shabsi Tzvi lived in Turkey. Um, he proclaimed himself that he was the Messiah. He had his own prophet. A lot of people believed him. The belief in him as being a um, possibly being Messiah spread throughout um, the Sephardic lands, I mean the lands in, under, in, in the Arab world, and also to Europe, all over Europe, it, 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 you know, it, it took hold in places like Amsterdam and other places. It was, mm. excuse me, it, was, it, it, it took hold very much. So what actually happened? How do we know we failed? Well, what happened is the Sultan of Turkey found out about it, and um, he was not very amused. So what he did is he captured Shabsi Tzvi. Um, he took him to his, his palace in, in Istanbul, which is we Constantinople, and he gave Shabsi Tzvi a choice. Either you convert to Islam or you are going to become a head shorter. And Shabsi Tzvi, being a smart fellow, decided that he was uh, going to become a Muslim. Now, that, of course, obviously sent strong reverberations throughout his following. However, Shabsi Tzvi was a little bit interesting in that. Um, what he did was he actually continued claiming he was a messiah, a Shia. Um, he actually and his followers actually, some of them actually converted to Islam, but they kept Jewish customs in private, publicly. They would look like Muslims, but privately they continued. And his followers continued to think that he was the Messiah after his conversion. Now, um, what's interesting, there's a whole book by Gershom Shalom about it. Um, he clothed a lot of his um, teachings in Kabbalistic things. And some of you may know there's a Ramchal, the Moshe Khan Wazado, actually wrote a work countering all of his uh, false Kabbalistic interpretations. But in, in essence, what happens, he converted to Islam. When he died, that actually continued in Turkey, a group called the Dunme, who were outside Muslims, in quiet by themselves in private, they were actually keeping Jewish customs following Shab Tzvi. Now, that wasn't all that happened. In Europe, in Poland, there came a person, Jacob Frank, who said that he was a reincarnation of Shabsi Tzvi. And what he did was, um, he was there, he actually converted to Catholicism outside, while internally he was doing things, um, pretty uh, crazy fellow to begin with. But the point of the matter is, is we hear a, 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 an instance here, of the same points that Festinger's book talks about, and uh, Expecting Armageddon in those articles talk about, where there's a group, they have a certain expectation, messianic expectation, that uh, Shabbos Yisrael would become the Messiah. 
uh, be the king. Um, something happens to make to show them that didn't isn't true. He converts to Islam. They reinterpret everything in order to make it appear that his conversion to Islam was actually part of God's original plan, that he had to do it, it was necessary to do it in order that his kingdom should come about, and they continue after that. This is exactly what we're talking about, a principle of failed prophecy. Now, closer to our time, we see that there are a number of people in Lubavitch nowadays who still maintain that the Lubavitch Rebbe is actually alive, uh, they do not go to his cemetery where he's buried because they believe that it's empty there, he's not there. And they still proclaim that he's the living uh, Messiah. Interesting enough. Now, we have to look at this interesting. I actually lived through the period be both beforehand and afterwards, so I know a lot about it, and I have some material actually from Lubavitch that wrote against it afterwards. So let's just let's look at what it is. When the Lubavitch Rebbe was alive, that means before he died, um, Lubavitch taught a teaching, which was something that um, was well known throughout Judaism. And that is, we believe the Messiah can come at any time. He could come actually in the middle of my giving this talk. Which means that there is somebody in every generation who could be the, the Mashiach, the time, time. Now, Lubavitch gave out in 1992, when Lubavitch was still alive, uh, a book, a little pamphlet called Mashiach Mechal Dor. Now, at the time, it was a predominant belief in, among uh, Lubavitchers that the, the Lubavitcher was Mashiach. That's per basically undeniable. I would say the percentage of Lubavitchers who believed that the Lubavitcher Rebbe, you know, was the best candidate to be Mashiach in his time, when he was alive among Lubavitchers, was pretty much 95%, if not more. So they gave this out. And this talks about some pretty mainstream stuff. This is this is not something that's way out there or anything weird. This is something that, you know, I believe it and, you know, the overwhelming majority of, of Orthodox Jews believe that Mashiach can come at any time. So I'll just give you two quotes that are here. One is from the, the a commentary on the book of, of, es, of Ruth. Book of Ruth. And it says here, this is from Avadya Mabartzenia a very famous commentary. Shall be called Dovidah in every generation. Noilud Echad Mezeda Yehida. There's born somebody who is from the uh, seed of, of Judah. Shahidu Liyos Mashiach Liso, who is worthy that he should be the Messiah of Israel. Now, at the time the Babich uh, um, said that it was the Rebbe, some people agree it's this great. It's not really important at the moment. He was certainly one of the greatest people in his time. Um, that's basically the knowledge by almost, almost universally. Now, there's another source that it brings here, I'm not going to do it a little bit longer, from the site of Stai um, who says also the same thing. And the reason is, of course, is because we know that Mashiach can come at any time. Now, when the Lubavitch Rebbe was alive, there was a lot of things written by Lubavitchers on this issue. So I just want to read one from that I have here. This is also when the Lubavitch was alive, called At Last. It uh, was written by a, a, a fellow called Issa Zaman Weisberg. Um, Rabbi Weisberg is from Toronto. Um, I'd like to read this specifically because I happen to know that this is, he was one of the people that I've seen later on after the Babish Rebbe died who changed his tune. But this is what the Babish Rebbe was like. I also could not understand what is meant by stressing that to regard an individual generous. Oh, before I say this, this particular thing was written. There was one... Um, a non-Hasidic rabbi in Israel who was very much against Hasidim, not just Chabad Hasidim, but very much against Hasidim. And he wrote um, against, you know, not just the belief that the Bible said could be Mashiach, which, you know, it's your, your opinion, whatever. But he also wrote specifically about the idea that somebody in every generation could be Mashiach, something that was pretty much well-known belief. So part of an answer to the specific rabbi is what's written here. I also could not understand what is meant by stressing that to regard an individual in our generation as Mashiach is considered heresy. We just have some sources here that's of course not the case. Was this meant to imply that Mashiach will be from by a bygone generation who will be resurrected at the time of the redemption? That is a question. This could not be the intent because it is in a clear contradiction to the Rambam's rule that we are not to expect any change in the order of nature with the coming Mashiach. 
surely resurrecting Mashiach is a change of the first order. So here we see that um, when the Babish was alive, it's quite clear that the belief of the Babish, and I'm going to show you in a second that the Babish himself pretty much says the same thing, um, that the person's Mashiach is somebody living in that generation. Um, he's not going to be resurrected to become a Mashiach. He's living in a generation. Now, we have, I have here a letter from the Lubavitcher Rebbe himself. I came to this letter because I was looking at some material that I have written after the Lubavitcher Rebbe died in 1994. And uh, this is cited. So in this letter, he is writing to somebody who has some questions about Mashiach. And he says this. He would have put Psak Tarisani Bagila has that it's very clear the halacha, the, the law of what's going to happen in the redemption, in the beginning of it, Haina, that means to say, that there has to be a man in the simplest meaning, there's got to be a man, meaning the uh, Mashiach. With all of his 248 limbs, meaning he's, it's a physical. Uh, and there's another place where it's in the Shuma Begifai, a uh, soul in the body. Not something, that's not him. But Hoyga Betoris Hashem, and he, he's going to Toris Hashem. He's going on to, to, to the Rambam. We're going to get to Rambam sometime later. The point being is that the Bab Shadab in the time when he was alive, pretty much universally, except for that particular rabbi who had something in basically for seeing the Bab, it's, it's a different story. Um, universally believed that the Messiah had to be someone who was alive. Now, what happened after he died? There existed, and there still exists today, a number of people in Babish who actually believe that the Babish Rebbe is alive, or he will be Mashiach, or whatever. Now, there are a lot of people in Babish who very much contend against it. That came out in um, 1997, a few years after the Babish Rebbe, uh, a series of writings called Kibbutz Mashiach Vigalua, where they tried to counter these people coming up with a new idea that a dead person could be Mashiach. That the Baba Shabbat, even after he dies, it no longer nullifies him to be Mashiach. I don't want to go into it because it's really not an issue there. The Rebbe certainly did hold by it, and there's a certain considerable amount of people within the Baba um, that don't hold. It's not a, the Baba, it's, it's a, an argument that's going on within the Baba itself. But uh, again, they have works about it. But the point here that I'm trying to make with reference to the issue we're talking about. Here we have a clear thing. The belief was that the Baba Shadab was Mashiach. He got sick and he died. And he never was able to send up a kingdom. So if he was the one who was worthy in that generation, it was obvious he was a very great person. Um, just because you know it doesn't happen to a generation worthy does not take anything away from his greatness, but that he just did not succeed. This is an event that happened. There was a group of people together. They redefined the whole situation. It has to be that, no, it doesn't mean he died. He can come back and does. And they exist. They exist today. I had a recently discussion on Facebook with a fellow. Um, he wanted to tell me that the Lubavitch said was still Mashiach. Rather than saying that, you know, in his time, he could have been the one who could have been it. He could have been worthy to it. He certainly was a great person. Nobody can doubt about that, and it's, you know, it's up to Hashem who it would have been. That was one of those secrets. However, I just pointed out to remember that the Bab Shadab, when he was alive, made it quite clear that there's a living person each generation. And when he says living person each generation, he means a soul in a body, a physical human person living at that time. At this very second, there is somebody alive who, if our generation is worthy, he will be called upon the high Shem to be Mashiach. Now, as it is, by the way, there are the Drashim that, that support it also that I know of. Um, that in fact there's a, a Mashiach living, and that when the time actually comes, it's going to reveal something that you're the one supposed to take out. So again, what I've shown from these two situations within Jujim, Shab Sitfi, and also this group that exists in the Babish today, who have deviated from, from I guess, the mainstream or whatever, um, the point being is that we do see that there is, even within Judaism, we can find it happening, it's a general rule. Oh, by the way, this work, uh, Expecting Armageddon, I showed you before, it actually has a chapter on Lubavitch and those people in Lubavitch who actually um, did, want, did not want to accept the mortality of the Rebbe and understanding that 
Well, he could have been Mashiach in his lifetime. Um, that time has passed and it's for somebody else. So we see within the Jewish context that can happen. So I see there's about 10 minutes and I have a lot of things in the New Testament to go over. Right. So I think think what I want to do is, I mean, I've got about 10 different passages in the New Testament to build the argument to show where we can see it actually from there, the same type of thing happening. Um, so I think what might be a good idea is, do you want to take a look and see if there's any questions until now? I did cover a lot of material. I don't know how many people are up to the uh, these issues here. Are there any questions there that... Uh, Lots of conversations, want? but not necessarily questions. More, uh, there's some accusatory Christian comments by a certain individual, but... Yeah, nothing really that's directly associated, so we can just move on. Uh -huh. Okay, I don't want to go, things like this, I'm going to... Unless, of course, you would like to talk to this man directly. He's calling in right now. <laughs> would you like to take a question? Well since, I, well, since I haven't talked about the New Testament, I don't think there's anything we talk about. I mean, you know... It's a New Testament thing, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, uh, I, don't want, I don't want to deal with, you know, unless he's seen where my argument's going to be about the New Testament, he really doesn't, he's not going to see it. Right. Right. Okay. okay. But there's a, there's a good example of it. I mean, if once call can say hello to me, I can say hello to anybody. That's fine. No problem. Okay. Well, if he calls back, I'll answer. Okay. All right. I mean, I can say hello to him, but I, I haven't discussed what, I, what we see in the actual New Testament itself okay. to show historically that we can actually point to a... I think you would like talking to him because he, he tends to try to quote a lot of Talmud to prove the New Testament. So I think you would be uh, uh, quite a refresher. There he is right there. Let's take the call. Hello, Luke. Uh, Hello. This, hey, you're live on the air. Would you like to ask a question to the rabbi? Hey, how's it going? Uh, yes, I, I would. I would love to ask a question. Uh, my question is okay. in regards to Isaiah 53. Oh, well, okay. Well, let me stop you there. Um, we're going to go in, into Isaiah 53 in in excruciating detail. Okay. When I'm, I mean I'm excruciating down detail, I mean excruciating detail. Do you have I would a, love to. Do you, I we're love going to discuss it from not only the biblical point of view, we're going to go through all the rabbinic literature about it. Um, we're going to go through it in excruciating detail. Luke, just real so, quick before you hang up, I mean, you know, do, do you have a to specific... Give you, to give you a partial Ryan? answer in, in, in like two minutes, I don't think it's going to be fair to you. Okay. okay. Bottom line is that, um, that Isaiah 53 is referring to Israel. Um, the servant there is um, actually somebody who has sinned. And it's talking about how Israel, in their exile, their suffering, the exile, atones for the sins. And I will, do, I will deal with all these issues. Okay. Okay. Can I can I tell you how I interpret just just one verse in there, real quick? Rabbi, it's up to you. Well, it's, let's, let's put it this way: we don't look at verses; we look at passages. Right. Looking at one verse okay. doesn't really tell you what it means. Every every you know. Proverbs is based on verses. You could take a verse out of Proverbs and talk about it. We can talk about what it means. We can spend hours about talking about a single verse in Proverbs because proverb is basically a proverb. Isaiah, and it, actually the truth of the matter is, you can't understand Isaiah 53 unless you recognize that Isaiah 40 to the end is basically has to be looked at as one complete book, almost by itself. There are a theme that starts oh. from Isaiah 40 from the very beginning continues going in and out throughout the rest of the book. Okay. And it starts well, the theme from the very I beginning. So unless you know the whole thematic thing, what's going on there, it, it, you know, it, it, it becomes a discussion that we're really going to just argue back and forth and we're going to end up talking past each other. And I don't really want to do that. And you certainly don't want that to happen. You really want to have a good dialogue where we can actually, you know, discuss this and understand each other and see where it's coming from. What I would suggest to you, though, however, is Go back, read straight through from Isaiah 40 to the very end, and make a note on the side. I, I actually, as, you, as you're going to, what just, themes are coming up? Yeah, I, I actually was just reading through Isaiah. I just, I just wrote a synthesis paper for it, actually. Um, and when, when, I, when, I, when I look at I, I, Isaiah, for example, um, what we see is in verse 13 of 52, um, you see that, behold, my servant shall deal prudently, he shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. We see that same language 
used of the Lord on his on his throne in Isaiah six, high and lifted up and exalted. And then you keep going. You, you see his glory here. You, you see a glimpse of his glory that comes after his suffering. But when we get into the passage of Isaiah fifty three, you see who has believed our report. So obviously not everyone has believed it. And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? The arm of the Lord revealed refers to the salvation of God. So not everyone has had the salvation okay, okay, of God. Okay, okay, again, you've, you've done three, three, three verses, three, four verses. It'll probably take me 20 minutes to half an hour to go through those three, four verses. Very okay, good. It's not that simple, okay? Right. And that's why I, I really don't want to be unfair to you. I'm, so please, please forgive me. I really feel sorry. Because I know Isaiah 53 is probably Hello, one there? of the most important things for, for Christians. Are you there, my friend? Okay. So my point is, is, is I don't want to be unfair to you. There's a lot of stuff that has to be done before you even look at <laughs> Isaiah 53. Right. And um, just as, as closing comments, we've been dialoguing quite a bit on YouTube with Luke. Um, Luke, just, just for your own benefit, uh, look at Isaiah 53, 9b. Uh, and compare it to Zephaniah three thirteen. They both were, they were both speaking of the children of Israel, the remnant yeah, that, of Israel. That, that, so carrying on, Rabbi, I know you're running out that, of time. That's understood. So. Also, except there's more involved with that. You really, um, you really have to start towards the end of Isaiah fifty three to understand when God says exactly what things are about. Right, right. Very good. Okay, I've got somebody knocking on my door for some reason. Because <laughs> you're a popular guy. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so I think we need to uh, close out here. Okay, we'll wrap up for sure. Uh, that sounds good then. So um, we'll look forward to seeing you next week, but probably not the following week because you'll be uh, yeah, you have prior, weeks, prior. Next week I'll be here, but two weeks not. Let me just, I okay. have to close off because somebody's knocking on me. Okay, no problem. Thank you, Rabbi. We'll talk to you soon. Shalom, shalom. Okay, so um, since Rabbi's gone, so Luke, just to be on the uh, straight up side, again, you really can't, it, interestingly enough, you're, you're quoting everything you even mentioned tonight. You, you're really quoting it from Christian theology. Um, these are things that we covered, man, years ago, and we've got dozens of shows on these very points that you're bringing up. Um, you know, who who has believed our report? I mean, that doesn't start in Isaiah 53. That starts in Isaiah 52 towards the end, and it's not who you think it's talking about. And the only way you'll find that out is if you go back to 52 and read it in context. So the verses and stuff that's actually put there, the, the numbers separating these things, those were not in the original text. That's something that was put there through Christian authors and all this other stuff to try to help organize the scriptures, and they, they're very misleading. And you need, you got to know where to read from. Phone lines are closed. I'm not going to take any calls because I've got a, another show starting in 30 minutes. So, uh, But just closing comments. Um, the con Like I said, all the comments that you're bringing in are... That's actually right about Let me pull them back in for a second. Rabbi, are you there? I think he called back on, actually. Okay, I'm going to hang up. So anyway, there you go. That makes for a good show, at least. Uh, Luke, sorry, buddy. I got a, I got another show starting soon. Uh, feel free to tune in, and we will see you guys. I guess he's doing this on purpose because he's calling back again, I think. Well, the screen's gone. All right, we'll try again. Rabbi, are you there? Are you there? Yes, I'm here. Oh, did you call oh. back, or is it an automatic callback? I called you back. Oh, okay, good, good, good. So we we, we got about four minutes left if you want to take them. Um, oh, listen, if you want to, I'm sorry. Somebody came here, you know, collecting No, that's money. okay. That is perfectly fine. Somebody from Eretz it's, it's and you, right you don't need to hear a story. Um, anyways, Luke, listen, if, Luke, if you're still listening, um, I very much appreciate your interaction. But again, there's a lot of things. What you might want to do is an introduction on my website, Judas with an Answer, there is an in-depth discussion about all the issues regarding Isaiah 53. You might want to look at that first. And, uh, but I will go over it in much more detail when we actually get up to one of our shows. Um, I'm going to present it slightly differently with slightly different stuff, but basically the same. There's no really no difference to what it is. But there's a lot of stuff there. Right. You see me? Yes, I see you fine. And did you say that you were going to? Uh, well, actually, I did see you. Yeah, I still see you now. Did you say that uh, you may not be available this coming week also? So the next two weeks, okay. right? Next next Sunday, I will be available. Okay, but two but weeks I'm after leaving, that, you won't. I'm leaving the Wednesday after that for Israel. Okay, and I will not be returning for ten days or so. Okay, got it, got it. We'll keep in touch on that. So until then, and the time is like seven hours later, so it's like it's going to be really difficult to um, right. 
But again, look, I'd encourage you to actually listen. I will actually, once I get up to that, you will be more than welcome to come on even, maybe I'll make some time here, you can come in and discuss with me things. But um, I want you to keep an open mind, look and read what I said. um, The basics are out there on my website about Isaiah 53, including all the rabbinical literature that's out there. Right on, right on. Very good. All right, Rabbi, well, thank you for your time. I uh, look forward to seeing you on the next show. Hope you have a great week. Okay, and we will continue next week to actually flesh out a little bit more about what's going on. That sounds like a plan. like it. Okay. All right, have a good one. Thanks, Rabbi. Thank you, guys. See you later.